are listening to the Latter-day Ladypreneur podcast. I'm Sarah Grace Allred, your host. Welcome to a sweet mix of interviews with business gurus, as well as solo episodes with me about the lessons, strategies, and inspiration that brought me from bumbling around in business to playing big in the fantastic arena of entrepreneurship. Look, the real magic comes when you and I get to talk business alongside the brilliant words of Esther, Nephi, and even Sherry Dew as we explore who we can become while we engage in this exciting journey as a woman of faith and an entrepreneur. Let's get started. Hey you, it is Sarah Allred and welcome back to the podcast. I'm having a bit of a fangirl moment here as I'm sitting across from someone for the podcast today that I waited two hours in line to get her to sign her book that I just bought. And so I am just thrilled to introduce you to Noelle Pikus Pace. Hi, Noelle. We're glad you're here. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. You're incredible. <laughs> so we have discovered a couple of things in preparing for this podcast. Number one, we are the same age. <laughs> Go 38. Apparently 38. that's the arrival point is age 38. Um, and we've also discovered that we both are just crazy about helping women do awesome things. Um, and we've discovered a couple of tips and tricks on how to do that through our own failures and sadness and loneliness and fun and experience and all those things. So you are the perfect person to be here on the podcast in early 2021. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I am so excited to be joining all of you. Um, you are all incredible. And I, I wish we could see you face to face, but it's so good to be here. Thanks, Sarah. So if you are for some crazy reason, unfamiliar with Noel Pike's face, okay. Maybe I can bring this to your remembrance. If you are an Olympic watcher, which my family growing up, we only watched TV like twice a year. It was conference. And then if the Olympics was on, I swear it was like, we were in a TV family. Okay. <laughs> and I will never forget. And Noelle, I didn't know your history going into this, but I will never forget the year 2014 Sochi in Russia. I hope I'm even in the right continent. Okay. We're in Russia and watching this, and we were saying Mormon back then, this Mormon woman skeleton writer go down this crazy track. And at the very end of it, I will never forget it. And I still get like tears in my eyes thinking about it, that you get down to the end of the track, you look up at the time and you know, it is a medal. You know, it's a medal. And not only do you know it, you decide to climb the fence to go see your family, to celebrate with them in that moment. And I have never forgotten it, Noelle, as you probably haven't as well. Can you just let us relive it for a minute on that yeah. moment? Yeah, sure, man. Even you saying it, it just like gives me goosebumps because I, it, it, it just gave me so many emotions in one single instant. And, you know, a lot of people saw that moment and they saw it as, wow, that was incredible. You just won this medal, but it was a 15 year journey. So, you know, when we talk about being entrepreneurs, being moms and trying to balance life, it's a journey. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon as we all know. And, um, as I stood up at that line for my fourth and final run, so in skeleton, it's head first on your, this little cookie sheet going 90 miles an hour with my chin less than an inch off of the ice and we go down this icy track on the side of a mountain um, and we reach speeds like I said of 90 miles an hour but we get down this mile long course in about 50 seconds so it's quite the rush we steer with our shoulders and our knees there's a lot of analyzing that we have to do a lot of studying working out track and field workouts so all this had led up to this moment um, I missed out on the 2006 games due to an injury I finished fourth in the Olympics in 2010 and retired and had kids along the way and over the for the previous two years leading into the 2014 Olympics my husband designed and built my sled our two kids um, we're traveling by our side in and out of hotels for the for the two years leading into it um, because I was trying to find this balance as a mom and uh, you know following my passion my career and the way that we found to do that was to do it together and so leading into this moment it was so much more 
than what <laughs> maybe what spectators saw. There was so much that went into that moment. And as I, I remember going in and out of every corner down this, this, you know, track, this icy track in Russia, 16 corners, 17 corners, 18 corners, come across the finish line and stretching my head forward just to hope, just with that hope that it was enough and um, that my efforts were enough. And I didn't know if it was gold, silver or bronze, honestly, but when I looked up and I saw my coach step into the, into the pathway right at the end of the track and he threw his arms in the air and immediately the crowd was going crazy and and I just remember jumping off my sled and having being so filled with emotion and overcome with um, tears of joy, tears of sadness, like just all the emotions. Like I can't, I can't even explain how many emotions went into that moment, but all the volunteers, these cute Russian volunteers were saying, you need to come over here to the right. You need to come over here and go be on USA Today and, and Giddy Images and, and do all your you know, media. You know, your, this is your moment of fame. And I said, no, 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 I need to be up there with my family. And I jumped over the side of the track and jumped up into the stands to embrace my family and all I could say was we did it we did it and um, I that moment was solidified as the moment of the games and it wasn't I wasn't doing it for show I wasn't doing it <laughs> to get an accolade of any kind it was because that was truly where I wanted to be was with my family and in their arms and embrace them and share that moment with them and um, to me you can hear my voice starting to shake a little bit but to me that was much more much more memorable or um, it, much more important to me to be there with them than in front of any camera or, um, you know, or even that moment of having the metal placed around my neck. That was amazing, an incredible moment. But for me, the moment was being able to embrace my family and to hold them tight and to say we did it. Oh, it is unforgettable. Absolutely unforgettable in my mind. I've watched it numerous times preparing for today. And it's still, I feel like I'm still back there um, that long ago, just watching all of that happen. And I, I remember, I mean, in 2014, how old were we? Because we're the same <laughs> Let's age. See. We were, we were, well, it's been seven years now. That's so <laughs> crazy. Oh my gosh. So 31? 31-ish. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we're like 31-ish. And at that time, you know, I had two kids and I was sitting there watching you and my biggest, I was first like sobbing and excited because you were like me, because you were a member of the church and you were a woman and you were a mom. And I first had that huge resonance. And then I had a question. I, I just thought, how I'm over here. Like, I can't even remember to drink the milk before it expires. Like it felt like, wait, how, how, and not a, not a, not a, oh, I'll never accomplish anything. How, but like, how, like, how did she do this? And I, I, I asked some of my friends that I secretly told them, I said, look who I'm interviewing, by the way, <laughs> big deal. This is so fun. And I said, what do you want to know from her? And you know what? They have the same question. Because we so often as women who are fiercely loyal to the gospel, fiercely loyal to our families, our husbands, our kids, how do we do it? And is it worth the price for those big dreams we have? Can I put you on the spot? What are yeah, your thoughts with sure. that? For sure. So my thoughts that I have with that is um, moderation in all things. First of all, there was a time when um, I didn't find that balance in my life. There is so there are so many blessings that come from finding balance in our lives, um, you know, within our careers, with our families, with our finances, with our social, mental, spiritual health. I mean, you look at the whole aspect of your life, all these different areas, and there is strength in finding balance. I remember when I went to the 2010 Olympic Games, I had taken a year off to have our daughter, and I, I came back the following year, two years um, before that. My daughter was born in 2008, and I went to the Olympics in 2010. And I was miserable. Like, I have to tell you, I was miserable every day that I was gone training, every day that I was out competing, I was not happy. I was miserable. And um, the reason was, is that I was putting all my time into my career that I felt so guilty, like so much, just, I can't tell you the weight on my shoulders. And I just, I just was not happy. And when it came to the date of the Olympic games in 2010 in Vancouver, Canada, I didn't care how I did. Like it got to the point where this whole really? journey 
being successful and I didn't even care. I got up to the competition and before the competition even came, all I was hoping for, all that I was looking forward to was it being over. And so once I finished fourth, um, I remember crossing the finish line. I finished fourth, which by the way, is the worst, absolute worst place you could ever finish in an no Olympic medal. state, in Olympic games, right? Gold, silver, bronze, and then nothing. And I finished fourth by a 10th of a second. And I crossed the finish line and I'm pretty sure Sports Illustrated, they, they named me something. They named me like the most optimistic loser or something like that <laughs> because, <laughs> because when I crossed the finish line, I just got up with a big smile and I'm like, oh man, dang it. I missed it. All right. See you later. I'm out of here. And you know, I just like left. I was like, I'm done. I'm retired. I'm over. I'm going to go be with my, my child. I'm going to be with Lacey. We want to have more kids. I am done with this endeavor. And, um, that's how done I was because my life was so out of balance. And so going back when we decided to go back into, see, I said, we, yeah, when my husband and I, and, um, at that point we had another child, a boy, uh, when we decided to go back to compete, I knew I had to find balance. So I called my strength and conditioning coach and I said, Hey, I know that most Olympians train like, you know, six days a week, seven days a week. They train like all the time, you know, like six, eight hours a day. I'm going to tell you what, I need to be faster than I've ever been before. I've had two kids. I have a rod in my leg. I'm missing a ligament in my knee. Like I have all these issues, but I can only give you three days a week for three hours a day. That's all I've got. If I want to find balance in my life, that's all I can do. Three days a week, three hours a day. That's it. And he was like, in shock. He's like, uh, this, that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how this works. And I just, I put my faith in heavenly father. And for me, that was my answer. That was my answer. I said, heavenly father, I really want to go back to compete, but I need your help. I want to be a mom. I want to be the best wife I can be just as we, as we all are trying to be fearless in, um, in parent parenting and being a, you know, housemate, you know, all, all these different areas of our lives, all these different aspects, um, and fearless with the gospel devout, a devout Christian, devout follower of our Savior Jesus Christ, I was trying to find balance. And that was the answer that came to me is that as you tone down, as you simplify your goals and, and take away some of them, some of these that you even think that you need, just take them away, take them away, pick it apart and be extremely intentional with what you are doing in the time that you have. It, it'll work out. It's going to work out. And so I gave myself three days a week, three hours a day. And I said, when that clock hits, when it's time for me to be in the gym, I am 100% there. I'm not there. So we have a, we got a gym in our basement so that I didn't have to talk with, <laughs> that sounds really bad, but like to going to the gym, I'm not a talker. I don't want to like sit there and talk with other people. Some people go for socializing. I was there for a purpose. And so we got a gym in our basement. I would do my sprints out in our front yard so that I could have my kids in the house so that I didn't have to like leave somewhere. I just did my sprints in the street. It was totally rocky, like ghetto style. I would do like, <laughs> like all these other athletes are going to Olympic training centers. And I was like climbing up a dirt hill next to my house and um it worked i came back competing i came back running faster than i did when i had a full ride scholarship track and field scholarship so it works um if we put our trust in heavenly father it, again again mind-blowing and i i see so many of our listeners and myself in my own entrepreneur journey and in their journeys that we so want the smooth road like and, and in my, my entrepreneur world, like they, they want a team, they want a team to be able to run things and they want the software that makes things faster. And, and we want, you know, the collaborations and like, we want things to look like sparkly and pretty. And I am imagining you sitting there, your neighbors are like, there she goes again, like doing the sprints down the street. Like there's nothing, there's nothing special about that. There's, there's nothing high tech about that, you know, and getting rid of all those things. I, I really admire that, that it's like, there is no excuse in the book. This is what I can give. I know what the Lord can provide. I mean, it's loaves and fishes. It's loaves yep. and fishes. So let me ask you this then. I mean, we hear about you pretty much being like, oh, sweet fourth place. I'm out. And you're leaving the Olympic games in 2010. Why did you decide to do it again? I know I was done. I was so done. And I was happy picking the strawberries in my yard and making strawberry jam. And I, is and I that made true? A, it was true. Like I made a t-shirt quilt. Like I just, I just like soaked up like the, the normalcy of being like, like at that point I became an Olympian. A, yes. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is what it's like to live like a normal, you know, quote unquote life. Yeah. I was like, wow, like I'm here when 
my husband gets home and when my kids are here and then I start getting like that itch, you know, and we started talking about it. But the real thing that happened um, was that I was pregnant with our third child. And, um, and so I was really looking forward to like, I was looking at the future as, okay, we're going to have our third child that this year I was, I'm much of a planner. I like to plan things. I'm a, Great. I like to see ahead and say, okay, so if I get pregnant during this time and I have a baby during this time, then we can have another one. Like, I really just like the, <laughs> that's maybe sounds many weird, will resonate. Like, it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like having a plan, you know, I like knowing what's, what's ahead of me. And so I had this plan and I'm like, okay, so we can have our child in the summer of 2012 and then we can or you know it was 2012 we'd have a, this baby in the summer of 2012 and then thinking about the future and heavenly father had a much different plan for me so um i i was pregnant with a little girl and um her heart just stopped beating at 18 weeks and i wasn't ready for that like i wasn't it was it was a, such a blindsided hit um it, it just came out of nowhere and when i lost her um I was devastated. I was, oh. I, I was, um, I, I, I didn't want to wake up in the morning. You know, I didn't want to think about the day. I couldn't take care of my two little kids. Like, see, I'm getting teary eyed again, but, um, this it is was major. Just, this is it major. Was a really dark place. Yeah. It was a really dark place to be because I didn't know how to, and I didn't know how to get myself out of it. And people would say, Oh, you should be feeling better by now. Like people would tell me that I should be okay with it. And I wasn't. And um, I remember the, the the pinnacle of this, and this might be taking it a little far, but my sister thought it would be great. She's like, we just need to get you out of the house. Let's go to, let's take um, Lacey and Trace and my little kids. Let's take them to Hogel Zoo. We're going to go to the zoo and see all the animals. And we went to the zoo and I swear every lady there was pregnant and everybody yeah. had a little baby. And it was like, <laughs> I had to walk out. I just went out and I just sat in the car and cried. And um, this is where I was. And my, and my husband Jansen could see it. And he knew that I needed to change directions. He knew I needed something to focus on, something else to focus on. And so that's when um, he brought up, he said, what if you go back to compete? He knew I couldn't, I wasn't ready to get pregnant right away. I just wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, what if, what if you go back to compete? And I kind of rolled my eyes. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, we already talked about this. I don't want to leave you again. I hate airports. I hate saying goodbyes. And um, he said, no, no. What if we could do this together? What if we never have to say goodbye? What if we, I'm there with you right by your side? And what if Lacey and Trayson can come along with us? And I was like, how is that, how is that even possible? And he, and all he said was, don't worry about the how. I'm just wondering if that would be something you'd want to do. And, and I was like, well, yeah, like that sounds like, you know, wonderful. That sounds fun. That sounds great. That sounds exciting. Something to look forward to. And he said, okay, don't worry about it then. Just call your strength and conditioning coach. You do your thing and I'll figure out everything else. And, oh, wow. um, happened. And so I went back to compete. We traveled, we ended up raising money, fundraising and, and amazing donors helped pitch in. And then as I started moving up the rankings, I started getting sponsors, but it provided a way for us to travel the world. And I truly believe, I truly believe that if we have the Lord's interest at heart, um, we decided to go back to compete, to show to the world that as a family, we were stronger, that we believe in the core values, a husband and a, and a, a man and a, and a woman and kids. And just this, this picture of that, you can do it together. It doesn't have to be that you choose your career over your family or that you choose a, not to have a dream because you have kids. That's, that's not what Heavenly Father wants. He wants us to progress. He wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. He wants us to use our talents to help other people. And so if we turn to Heavenly Father with our problems, with our trials, with our struggles, and we come up with a way, and we just like with, um, we really like, there's a scripture in Doctrine and Covenants where it says, um, that we shouldn't be, we should always be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of our free will and choice. And for us, we're like, okay, we couldn't get an answer. Should we go back to compete? I don't know. Should we go back to compete? I don't know. I don't feel like I'm getting an answer. And finally we said, all right, let's make the decision. I'm going back to compete. Heavenly father, will you help provide the way? And all of a sudden miracles started happening once we took that step of faith, but it wasn't until we took that step and said, okay, yes, we haven't found an answer, but we feel like we're doing this for the, you know, if, if it's good, it comes from heavenly father. If it's not, then it doesn't. And we felt like we were trying to do what was right. And, and it just opened up doors and we had to take two steps into the light and then a step into the dark and another step into the dark. And then the light would come and it was really a balance, but it worked out. And over those next two years, we were able to travel and compete. It was amazing. I love this. And I love so much hearing a couple of things. Number one, you've talked a little bit about, you know, after 
the, the see you later in 2010, I'm retiring, um, major trauma with this sweet baby girl that you lost that makes just breaks my heart. And, and that, that it actually, that, that spark is kind of what got you through and you got through it in a new way. And it was with that family. It was yeah. with that family. And when I, when I reread your book, um, this one's from, this one's called focused, but when I reread that book, um, I was reading a lot about your loneliness without your family and how you felt like an outsider and people didn't want to talk to you, or they would tell you to cover your ears. Cause what they're going to talk about, they knew you want to hear about, and that there just was such loneliness, such loneliness. And I think that my listeners, our listeners here, cause you're part of this, our listeners here, um, they can resonate with loneliness and interesting that you were feeling so lonely on the Olympic track and that they may be feeling really lonely in motherhood, or they may feel, feel really lonely in entrepreneurship or something like that. And what would be I mean, I know the answers you give here in your book. What is your current view on, on tackling loneliness? Cause there is yeah. nothing, there is nothing like really awesome about, well, there is something awesome because you're becoming something, but, th- but taking risks as an entrepreneur, as an athlete, like you kind of feel like you're the weirdo in the group yeah. and the weirdo in the ward. Like, how do you combat that? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I, I, I had to train. I mean, while my teammates would be off, you know, training at the Olympic training center, they would have a team. They would have, they had everybody together, but I was, I was the only one that was married on the team. Um, the only one by far that had kids. (laughs) Uh, and so it was a very lonely space to be in. And, and then I'd have to do my workouts every morning, like by myself. And I was out here and I was, I'm from Utah. So I was out here in Utah and my teammates were in New York or California at one of the Olympic training centers and they got to build and, and, um, have this huge support system. So I felt very lonely at many, many, many times. So a lot of times I had to come back to my purpose of why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it worth it? Because if I didn't know my purpose, then what, what the heck am I doing here? Like, why am I doing right. this? You know? So coming back to that purpose. And a lot of times what I've found is that um, for these big things we do in our life, for taking on a new career, for trying to be an entrepreneur and, um, you know, you go through like social media and you have to you find all the balance of marketing and you have to, as a small business owner, you're figuring out everything and platforms and, you know, email marketing. Like there's so much to do that it can be very overwhelming, extremely overwhelming. Um, and I, I realized on this, on this journey, right? Um, a couple things, I guess. One is to reach out to those, um, to use your resources and, and to ask for help. A lot of times we, as, you know, as business owners or as entrepreneurs or, or these, you know, these we're very, um, motivated women, right. That want to get something done that want to accomplish things. We like to take a lot of it on ourselves and we like to hold tight to it. Mm. And we say, I can do that. No, I can do that. I don't need help. I can do that. I can figure that out. I can figure that out. So knowing when to let it go and to say, I do need help. Who's out here that can help me? Who, here's my problem, everybody. Who can help me? You know, you type it in in a message and you'll be surprised to see how many people will come by your side. Um, But if you stay in your own space and just keep saying, I feel so alone, I'm trying to do this all by myself. Guess what? I I just, you're, you're gonna grow so much slower than if you have people by your side that can help to lift you and support you and sustain you. Um, I definitely found that, for example, one of the things that I did, oh, we're coming back to purpose. And then I'm going to tell you one other thing. I tell you, get sidetracked. You're good. Coming back to purpose, um, finding that purpose. And a lot of times what I found on my Olympic journey, and even as an entrepreneur myself right now, I have to find my purpose. And a lot of times my purpose has to be layers deep. And what that means is that it's not just one single purpose as to why I'm doing what I'm doing, but then I have to dig a little deeper and then dig a little deeper and dig a little deeper. So like, why do I want to, I right now, why do I want to create online courses? Well, I want to help as many people as possible. Okay. So on a really hard day, is that really going to get me through it? Is that going to be enough to say, well, I really want to help people. Well, no, it probably won't. It's not enough. There's other ways to help people. I'm going to throw my hands in the air. There's other things. Other people are out there to help people. (laughs) Like, you know, and you start saying, okay, then what else? Why else do I want to help people? Well, 
I have some skills that I think can really, that are really unique for other people. Is that enough to get me through today? Ah, uh, it's, it's getting a little closer. Okay, why else? Well, I really want to progress forward. I want to learn more. I want to grow. I want to be a light. And it's, so you just start digging and digging and digging at these different purposes. And sometimes you have to go 10 layers deep before you find that purpose that is gonna sustain you for that day. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing, even on my Olympic journey, there I came to a point um, about a year. So this was in 2013 going into the 2014 games when I really was just burnt out. Um, I was waking up every morning at 5 a.m., getting my kids sippy cups and cereal snacks ready and having the remote control ready to play on Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Yes. <laughs> just like trying to do what I could, you know? And um, I would step outside of the door to do my sprints outside. But in case my kids woke up early, I'd make sure that they were they had their thing and I'd have a little arrow, like I'd put it on a marker to show that they needed <laughs> to go sit down on the couch. I'm outside. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd have a, I ended up the night before, I'd always put sippy cups of milk in the fridge so they were all ready and I showed them where they were and and I'd have baggies of cereal snacks. So they just grab them. I tried to be as prepared as possible, but I'd go out and do sprints. And I realized that my workouts weren't sustaining me anymore. Like even as an Olympian, I am so close to going to the Olympics only like it was like 11 months away. And I'm like, I just don't want to wake up tomorrow at 5 a.m. and do a workout. Like I just don't want to do it anymore that I'm like so burnt out. Wow. So I did. I reached out to my closest friends. I reached out to my closest, the people that that were closest to me. I reached out to my sister and two of my friends. And um, I said, I am really struggling. Like they, you know, they'd ask, how are you doing? I am really struggling with these workouts. And they said, well, then we're coming with you tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, my what? word. And they said, we're going to come and we're going to come work out with you. And they don't, they're not like, <laughs> like they're not athletes. doing the baggies of cereal at five in the morning. Like you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just, they were just willing to jump in and, yes. um, and, you know, maybe it wasn't, they, they couldn't sprint as fast as I did, but they were there, they showed up. And a lot of times that's what it is, is with, you know, any kind of progression, it's not about finding these massive milestones. It's about showing up. It's about showing up each day and just being ready to take one little step forward, just one. And the, the principle that I love to focus on is 1%. If you could be 1% better today, you were doing great. You know, 1%, that's not 10%. You're not asking for 50%. I'm not asking for these high expectations. It's just a teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny bit better today. Do one thing that's going to improve your business. Do one thing that's going to improve your family, whatever that might be. Do one tiny little thing and and allow yourself to be okay with that because we have very high expectations. And a lot of times we're, we're very much overachievers and uh, yeah, just be 1% better. That sounds like a James Clear concept from Atomic Habits, which is like yeah. my it second Bible. Yeah, it is. It's a good one. <laughs> and good I, I love that so much because the work of an athlete and you are now an entrepreneur doing online courses and, and the work of an entrepreneur, it is never ending. It, it will never end. You can work out for eight hours a day, or you can work out for an hour and a half a day, or you can work out all day. Like there is no magic. I am done in the world of entrepreneurship, in the world of athletics or in the world of motherhood. Like it is just never done. And so that ability to, to watch your story and to just see, okay, like Noelle has accomplished this incredible thing, this little, this check mark with this silver medal. That's probably what a lot of people know you for, right? Is that moment. And, and yet the, the real interesting part of the story is how you got there. It is the husband building the sled and it is the retirement in 2010. And it is, you missed world championships sometime because you were giving birth. I mean, like yeah. those are the, those, like, I think we have to remember that our heavenly parents so desire for us to become something. And yeah. it is through, it is through the, the sisters and the families coming over and working out with you. And it is through those conversations with your husband. And, and so as we talk to these listeners, if you experience resistance, it isn't necessarily because you're doing the wrong thing. It's because you're being taught to make hard decisions and you're, you're being taught to have conversations with your family and, and develop these kinds of skills because God needs amazing women. Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, incredible. I know. I know before we started this um, recording, Sarah, you and I were talking about how a lot of times we expect the path to be so flat and easy and straight. And that's just not what Heavenly Father wants of us. I mean, he expects us to have roads and hills and ups and downs so that we can grow. That's what our Heavenly, Fa Heavenly parents want of us is that we experience these things so that we can grow, so that we can help others to grow and it won't be easy. So um, I love that you touched on that. 
Uh, well, and one thing I really would love to focus on at the last part of this interview is I like literally my jaw dropped when I saw that you are off offering mindset classes for young people. Okay. I'm like, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh my word, if I could handpick someone, you know, to do this, here you are, here you are doing this. And um, a couple of my followers that I was asking about you, about what they wanted to know from you, they had a really fabulous question. They said, okay, so we've got this amazing mindset that um, for, for athletes and young people and incredible things taught by you yourself, what are some things that we can empower ourselves with as moms with our little people, um, you know, teenagers and, and younger to help them with resilience and mindset? Like the world is different now than when we were kids in the eighties, cause we're both 82 oh, yeah. babies. So yep. <laughs> what are those shifts that we can make as moms to help them in their mindset? Um, honestly, I think the, the Church of Jesus Christ has hit it spot on when they implemented the Children and Youth Goals program. Um, just helping our kids to set goals, to work hard for them, and to help them and support them and encourage them along the way, that's a huge way to help them build resilience and a strengthened mindset because they get to they get to celebrate their successes. They get to learn from their failures. They get to um, analyze and reflect back on what's going well, what's not going well. They get to strategically make a plan as to how to get there. There are so many, so it's so much more than just setting a goal and getting it, but it's in the process that we become. It's in the process that we are becoming. Um, and, and to become you know, who we are meant to become, to reach God's greatest potential, to reach our greatest potential that God has granted to us. That is only through progression and it's only through this constant progression. And so that's the number one thing that I have seen and can say and can share is to help our kids set and, and get their goals. And one thing that we do as a family is we love to create a bucket list. So um, we do this. I, I have a bucket list. My husband has a bucket list. We do a bucket list together. I highly recommend you working on a bucket list together as a family. Uh, we have one for the summertime, but we also have one just like for the year or an ongoing one where we sit down and we write down things that we're, in, we're interested in doing. And, um, we'll so sit what's down. What's the maybe power about, behind that? What's the power behind so the bucket list? There is so much power. Uh, one of the things that we do is just writing down all the goals that we want to achieve, anything and everything. It allows us to see the possibilities in front of us. And um, with resilience, I think one of the biggest things with resilience uh, and, and facing resilience is overcoming fear, is overcoming mm. anxiety and overcoming that stress that just... Oh, it locks us up inside, right? And if kids can see that the possibilities are endless before them, that there's really nothing holding them back, they don't have, for them to be able to pick up a harmonica and start playing it, they don't have to be the best harmonica player in the world. They just have to try, you know? And I truly believe that the only failure that we have in this life is never trying. It's not the actual losing or falling short. It's in actually not trying. That's the only failure there ever is. And so if we can teach kids to just put forth the effort to believe that it's possible, uh, then that resilience will grow. The anxiety will diminish or lessen and, and they'll see the possibilities before them and be willing to try. Oh, wow. The only failure that we can experience is not trying. Holy smokes. <laughs> Mic drop by Noel Pika's face. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, I have one more question for you that I did not prepare you for. And so welcome to Bring the podcast. Up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, your kids are now seven years older since the Olympic, yeah. the moment, right? The moment of the games. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that early journey for your family to that moment has impacted them now? Wow, that's a great question. So my daughter, uh, Lacey, she is now 13 years old. Holy um, our, son, our son is nine and we have added twin boys to our family and they are five years old now. So um, how did that, how did the Olympic journey influence their lives? I, it's interesting because I don't know that they even see it as this big moment in time um they see it they remember the stories they remember the places and they remember um the things they remember and they took away from it is i think Lacey is much better at speaking to adults than maybe other kids oh. her age 
yeah. uh, because that's all we had. Yes. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> our kids and the rest of the athletes, you know? So she would like make best friends. She'd go knock on people's door and I'd be like, where were you? She's like, I just hanging out with the bobsledders or they'd have them on her, you know, her on their shoulders or something. So I think that was one thing, but I think the biggest thing is being adaptable to different situations is being accepting of other cultures, accepting of other people. Um, and also seeing the hard work that goes into achieving your dreams and, and seeing failure, seeing sadness, seeing heartache, seeing, um, you know, and, and experiencing that. And I don't think that I'm unique to that. I don't think our family is unique to that. It happens in your own homes. Um, your, your kids see you working hard on your computers in your offices, and they see you trying to fulfill these dreams. And that goes a long way. Our examples are seen by our kids. They see us working hard. And so it's what we choose to teach in those times in between. And it's, you know, yesterday, for example, my husband was working on his computer and my son came home from school. He gets home at like 1.30. Um, so it's like the middle of the day, middle of a work day. And he's like, hey, dad, will you go play baseball? And there's like, <laughs> there's like six inches of snow on the ground. Oh. He's like, dad, will you go throw a ball? And my husband, I saw his face. He's like, oh, I'm just trying to get this done. Cause we are, we're in that process of like balancing software and email lists and doing all this stuff for my online courses. And uh, he's like, and I, I, I was in the other room just saying, come on, Jansen, make a good decision. Just make a de good decision. You know, what's more important, like being on your computer or just this one question from your nine-year-old boy that won't ever be nine years old again. And it was really cool for, to hear my husband say, he took a sigh and he's like, oh. Yeah, go, go get the gear. I'll, I'll be out in a second, you know, but I'm yes. like, good job for, for choosing your priorities when, um, and to be present. Um, and that doesn't mean we can always, you know, step aside or whatever, but in those moments, I believe that there are those moments. And um, I think our kids have grown with us from that experience. They now see us trying to fulfill our own goals and our own dreams. And I think that's the big picture. So it's not that we are unique to that. Each of us, each of you in your own homes are setting an example for your kids to follow, whether that means that work is more important to, that, to, to you than they are, or if it's that, oh, mom will take a second aside. It's important when I walk in the door from school that she sets her computer aside and she sets the timer for 15 minutes and I get to share my 15 minutes with her and then she has to get back on her computer, whatever that is, but to know that they are the most important important thing in your life and then uh, people in your life, you know, and then to say, okay, mom has to go back to work. And then they say, okay, I already shared my stories. I got out what I needed to say. And now you can go back to work. But giving them that time, I think has been a really um, critical aspect for us. It's such so. an amazing habit of yours to just see whether it's parenting or whether it's your Olympics or whether it's deciding to um, come out of retirement, all those things is that you are constantly reassessing. Yeah. It's just gosh, it's out of balance, reassess. It's out of balance, reassess. Like there's no, even if you read James, James Clear's Atomic Habits book, like there is no, the only silver bullet is constantly reassessing. <laughs> That's yeah. the only one, right? It's true. It's true every week. So for me, um, I like to follow the, it's called the will of life. Um, and I, I teach it in one of my, um, in my life stacking course, but it's taking these eight principles of our life where you talk about physical, spiritual career, finances, fun and recreation, family relationships. You take these eight, eight principles and, um, you gauge yourself on a scale of one to 10 as to how you're doing in the, all those areas of life. And what I like to do is to set one goal in each of those areas for the year. And that's my focus for the entire year. So then each month I go back to my goals from the, for, from the year and I say, how can I get closer to my year goals? by doing something this month. And then I actually do it each Sunday. So each Sunday, I'm just constantly saying, okay, so what have I done to build my relationship? What can I do? Oh, I mean, so I actually like time my texts. I sent out a couple of texts to my husband this week, just saying, I love you. Thanks for being a great husband, but I pre-scheduled them. <laughs> so, you know, so Exposed. <laughs> you are now exposed. <laughs> I pre-schedule it. So all of a sudden he'll come up to me like on Thursday or something. And he's like, oh, that was really sweet of you. And I'm like, for what? You know? And I'm like, oh, I mean, yes, it really was. Yes, I am on it. I am on it. It's oh. finding, finding balance. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I, I have hesitated to ask you this last question because I want it to come off in the right spirit. So if it's an awful question, we're going to delete it from the podcast. <laughs> But I think it's really valid. And it came in about two minutes before we got on the call. And it actually is from a friend of mine who had an acting career in her early 20s. And, and it fizzled out. It fizzled out. But she was in some like pretty major Disney shows, you know, and film and everything like that. 
And her question, and I'm not going to re- read it directly, but her question is, what do you feel like if you have already peaked, that you're past your prime, that your moment is over and that you're kind of a has been, she used that word has been. And I want that to come across in the right light, Noel, because your moment in Sochi isn't the greatest moment of your life. I don't want to say that and communicate that. I would imagine you can resonate with her in continually to progress after massively huge successes. Can I Sarah, ask you that? that question? That question is amazing. Um, and I think it's so relatable to every single one of us. So right, please read right. it out. Um, I've seen it with myself, with my career, um, with, with my career as a college athlete, honestly, not being able to do track and field anymore with my career as a skeleton athlete, not being that Olympian anymore with my mom in retiring from 30 years of working in the same place. Like I've seen it in so many lives, my father-in-law being in the military and retiring. I've seen, you know, so many chapters of our lives or with friends where all of their kids have gone on and now they're empty nesters. This is a very, very common experience, very common. And what do we do now? Now that I no longer have to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, now that I'm not there and people aren't relying on me all the time, now that maybe I'm not acting in the way that I was, you know, had planned originally in these films or whatever it might be, um, we all feel this way, all of us. And um, it's really just chapters in our lives. If, if we see a skill or a talent that we have or that we are striving to accomplish as our entire book of life, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. But if we see these talents and these skills as chapters in our lives, as one door closes and another one opens, and we're willing to discover our new talents and our new opportunities and the people around us in a new light, in a new situation, if we're willing to take time to see who we truly want to begin. And again, I'm going to come back to this, but if we can if we can define for ourselves what our life purpose is, and I know that's a very broad statement and it takes a long time to just kind of analyze. I'm going to read this for you just, Please. just for kicks. Um, I have, I, I've taken the time to write out what I feel like my life purpose is. Here's my life purpose. And I have it on my lock screen of my phone so that every time I touch my phone, I know what I want to be. I know who I want to become and it keeps me grounded. And here's my purpose. The purpose of my life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and cherish my loved ones, to pursue lifelong learning and growth, and to strengthen and share my gifts so that I might inspire others to live more fully, love more openly, and make a greater difference today. So my purpose in life had nothing to do with skeleton. My purpose in life has nothing to do with track and field or even these online courses that might come and go and who knows what's going to happen with them or with youth coaching. You know, these are chapters in their lives and I'm, I'm determined to be my best today. Come what may, I'm determined to give my best effort today and to see what, what comes of it, to hope for the best and expect the best to come, to have faith, hope, and charity. I'm striving to be better. And one of the best ways to do that is to discover the possibilities in front of us. That is why, to your dear friend that asked this question, that is why I created my bucket list. There is the why. Wow. Because I saw the end of my career coming in skeleton and I knew I was going to be heartbroken. I knew it was going to change me forever. And I knew this huge, massive chapter was coming to an end. And I did not know where to go. I did not know how to see the future ahead of me. And that is not, <laughs> that's not normal for me. And so I decided to create this massive list. I decided to learn Spanish. We moved to Costa Rica for a couple of years. Um, we've done a lot of different trips. We've read a lot of books. We've learned a lot of things. And in the meantime, I've wanted to teach people about, about a greater mindset, about developing their purpose. And now I, recently my, my chapter, another chapter has opened where I really want to help youth. I've always been passionate about youth. So Never stop discovering who you are. That would be that would be my ultimate. That's the stamp on the wall. Never stop discovering who you are, because we are immortal beings that are never going to stop progressing forward. And so, continue learning, continue discovering your talents. Never stop growing. Never stop progressing. Noel, I cannot thank you enough, and I'm patting myself on the back for asking that question because that was <laughs> insanely powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I can't, I really, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here. I knew, I knew cause we have a common friend and who connected us. And I thought she is going to be the perfect person 
to get our amazing listeners back on fire, moving forward, progressing, um, all in the spirit of furthering the work of the Lord. And that is why I just think you are one of the greatest on earth, um, to be doing what you're doing. So thank you so much again, so much for being here and being so open. Um, and we are so grateful. Thank you so much. I sure appreciate it. One thing I forgot to add is if you do want um, the children and youth, if you have any questions about children and youth goals, I have a free, it's just absolutely free course that I've heard a lot of great things. A lot of people have have been saying that how much it's helped them. So if you don't know where to go to help your kids set goals, I just forgot to mention, um, feel free to, um, you can check out my website um, and you can get that for free. It's just, I'm excited about it. So it's noelpikespace.com. Perfect. We've got it in the show notes here, um, as well as a a link to her life stacking course and then the youth um, mindset, everything like that. You'll find all of that in the show notes. And I think you're amazing. (laughs) Destined for good things. So grateful again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. You're amazing. Latter day Ladypreneur is brought to you by Sarah Grace Live, audio work done by Rachel Johnston. Huge thanks to the Sarah Grace Live team for pursuing our dream of Esther 414. Perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Playing big in business is an incredible road to you becoming who God created you to be. Find coaching, classes, community, and my key strategies to playing big in the show notes and at sarahgracelive.com. Thanks for listening.